What's happening, folks? It's Yannick Guzdala. It's the Yannick Guzdala podcast. Two things. What first thing? First thing first. Sorry, that is a couple of days late. I just got off the road, and uh, here we are recording on Tuesday, the fourth of July. Happy fourth to those of you who uh, celebrate that kind of thing. And the second thing is, I'm doing a big Fourth of July Independence Day sale. It runs for forty eight hours. It's already been in effect today, and as this podcast is going live on the morning of the fifth, it will still be running for another, I don't know, 12, 13 hours by the time this goes out. Uh, get 25% off all the books, all the book bundles, uh, music downloads, um, presets for the HX Stomp, a, a ton of stuff that's up there. You guys know what is up there. Um, also, private lessons are half price just for these two days. Um, there's no limit on how many you book, but if you want to book them at this price and spread them out over time, uh, you can do that, but you got to do it before the sale ends. They're half price right now. And for the 25% discount use the code red white and base all one word red white and base at checkout and it'll give you 25 percent off uh all the things i just mentioned and um yeah the irony is not lost on me that i am basically uh, i don't celebrate it at all but I'm, I'm by by doing this sale i'm celebrating independence from myself in uh in some respects holding you know u.s and uk citizenship and uh, having anything to do with Independence Day. It's a little bit of a strange, strange situation to be in. The irony is not lost on me, but let's get past that and get into the episode. Holy crap. Uh, so I preloaded, <clears throat> pre-recorded a couple before I left on tour. Those, uh, those came out. Thanks for your response on those. That was awesome. Um, now, <laughs> I'm back, and uh, a lot happened in the last three weeks, and... Uh, I don't actually know where to start. I think the fact that it had been a long time since I played that many shows on the trot. Uh, we played how many nights? We played fourteen nights total in the seventeen days we were gone, and the last three nights were two full shows a night. So it was like six shows in three days, and the first nine days, a. Hey, is Coley come to hang out on the couch? He almost, as you, any, any regular viewers of the podcast will know, Cole rarely comes out and hangs, uh, comes down and hangs out with me in the studio while I'm recording. But 4th of July fireworks are going off. I'm sure any uh, dog owners out there are in the same boat. Uh, if you're around fireworks, they hate it. So he's down here with me. Thankfully, the kiddo got to sleep through it all. It sounded like World War Three outside. Uh, I didn't realize that many people were into setting off that many fireworks. It wasn't even dark and they started going off. Anyway, Coley's hanging out, a little bit scared. Hey, buddy, maybe my cord voice isn't going to scare you more. I don't know. We're going to get into some of that in a little while. But yeah, so the first stretch of the tour was nine shows in a row, nine nights in nine cities. So travel every day, sound check every day, play every day, the whole routine every day for nine days. Then we had our one and only day off in 17 um we were meant to have two but then we got to some new arrangements of some songs that manuel uh, wrote on uh, and we were practicing on soundcheck and we finally got to playing them a couple of uh, on a couple of shows and steve was like mm, you know that thursday we were meant to have off in new york yeah we're going to the studio book the studio we're going to make cut new records so we didn't get a whole record out of it but we did go to the studio and cut like four or five tunes in an afternoon so that that one day we thought we were going to have off that sort of precious downtime ended up totally worth it. It was super fun to be in the studio, of course, and, and cutting a record with those guys. Um, but it did mean the, 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 the 17 days away became far more intense than I had anticipated or intended. And uh, yeah, it was good to sort of test myself again. I hadn't done that much sort of intense playing it's not like it's a gig I was just phoning in or a really kind of simple, you know, three chord gig every night. It's it was some serious shit. And um, one of the challenges, I think, as well, even on the parts of the show where it's like, OK, we are playing a similar set every night. A couple of things change here and there, but we're basically playing the same show every night. One of the challenges is, of course, trying to make it fresh, especially when you play the same set nine nights in a row. Um and, you know, I know there are people out there who play, you know, the same show for, for months on end when they're on tour. So I'm not trying to say this was any massive feat by any stretch of the imagination. And I've, I have done that before. 
for many, many, many years on the trot of being eight, nine months of the year on the road and playing exactly the same set, same tunes, exactly the same way every single night. So even on a gig where there's a lot of room to improvise and Steve gives both Manuel and myself uh, really uh, uh, just so much freedom um, there is an element of, you know, really playing the songs um, sort of the way they're meant to be played and the way Steve wants them to be played. So there's an element of concentration um, and of consistency with that that I think is sort of, you know, on the professional side of things. It's like you, I'm definitely striving for that every night to respect the music, respect the song, <clears throat> respect the band leader, of course. I come back to the to the West Coast and it's super dry, um, having been on the East Coast where it's super humid. So my, although I'm not sick and everything feels good, throat is a little bit dry here in California and it's hot as hell. So the air is on that doesn't help matters. So I'm going to be going to the uh, hydration um, probably a little more than usual. But yeah, th th so that's kind of one side of it. The consistency of the elements that need to remain so every night. And then, of course, not getting stuck in a rut of finding something that works on a tune in terms of a direction for your solo. Or there are a couple of spots in the set where uh, one where Manuel plays a long piano intro and one where I play uh, a bass intro. We, we completely uh, solo. So trying not to do the same thing every night uh, and really not do anything similar to the night before that's a challenge and it's is interesting to not only be in the middle of that myself and trying to figure it out and execute and whatever but also witnessing manuel do that as well and see where he goes and how one night it can be it very intense in a, in a dense kind of uh, linear way and other nights it's very mellow and chordal and just it's, it's amazing to see that range in a player and, and be able to sit like literally right next to the piano every night and, and feel that and hear that and you cannot but be inspired by that and be motivated and be immersed in great music when you're, when you're around people like Stephen Manuel for instance so Amazing, like really, really great few weeks on the road. Well, not even through 17 days on the road, really great 17 days on the road. And um, I had one bad night, I think. I, in fact, I don't remember which one it was. And it's not like I just don't want to say there was a night. And if I could remember exactly which one it was, I'll have to review the tapes a little bit more. Um, I think it was maybe the gig after the day off. Maybe it was the one in Littitz, PA. I can't remember. But like my brain started, I, I don't know, my brain started just going for some reason and zoning. I zoned out a couple of times and missed, missed some notes here and there. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a catastrophe by any stretch of the imagination. It was just not up to what I know I'd been capable of, you know, the previous nine nights, for instance. Um, so, yeah, that, that was another thing to deal with in the middle of it all. There were some really nice... Um, high points of being, um, being on certain gigs you know the two festivals we played rochester jazz festival was fantastic we did two full shows there um and cleveland the tri -C jazz festival was just kind of one long show one 90 minute show but then herbie hancock was playing after after us so packed all our shit up and got to see herbie a little bit from the side of the stage great to see Lionel, um if only for a moment i um, hadn't seen him in a while um, so yeah, there were some great moments like that. And, and like I said, we ended up playing the last three nights of the tour were, were at Birdland, which were two complete shows a night, two complete, like 70, 75 minute shows every night. So six shows in three nights. Um, great to see some friends. My buddy Aaron Goldberg stopped by on the last night, JJ McGee. And like, there were a couple of really like old close friends coming by. So there was a nice element, sort of social element, you know, musically related social element to it too that kind of rounded out the whole tour. And it was just nice to be on the road, um, nice to be playing great music, to be making a living playing great music, for great audiences to be out there. I met some, I know some of you guys have followed the podcast for sure because you mentioned it. So for everyone I met, thank you so much for coming out and bringing books to sign and all kinds of stuff. And um, shout out to Fabio, who I met out there in Littitz, PA, front of house engineer who was in town at the Claire Brothers um, Complex Compound. It's an insane facility they have out there in Littitz, PA, um, that's where we played at a venue called Mickey's Black Box. It was great to hang, you know, it was just totally random, sat down at the bar and, and 
cat next to me say, hey man, I just bought your book. And we get into talking and it was a, it happened to be our day off as well. So I actually had time to sort of relax and, you know, not be stressed out about having to get to a gig and rush. So it was kind of, I love fan interactions. I, I don't want to call fans, but like, you know, follower, shall we say, into interactions like that. When you meet people and they're just super cool and have a cool story to share. Um, so that's, that has always has been and always continues to be super rewarding you know meeting people through the books through the albums through the podcast through youtube and actually being out there in the real world and seeing people and talking to them rather than it being the comment section of youtube or what used to be like dms or instant messages or something on facebook or twitter or instagram or something is really nice to put a put a name to a face and hear a story and uh, and kind of hang and, and shoot the shit um, now the challenge is to switch gears completely and to put all of that in the rear view mirror. But actually, that's a lie, not all of it. To actually build upon the consistency I feel like I've uh, built in my, in my technique and in my playing over the past few weeks, but channel that into the new album, into the next project. I'm taping this on, uh, oh yeah, July 4th. What am I talking about? God, like I would have taped the podcast yesterday. Because I came home yesterday and the kiddo did go down and there were a couple of hours in the evening. But my brain was just, there was just no way it was working. I, I got back to got back to the apartment at maybe 1.30 or 2 in the morning after the last Birdland gig. And the car came to get me at like 4.30 in the morning to fly home. So yeah, it was, uh, the brain was just fried. But yeah, I'm taping this on the 4th of July and literally a month from now on the 4th of August the whole band will land in Buenos Aires and we'll, we'll get to work. We'll get to, uh, get to our accommodation, maybe sit down, have a talk about the music, hang out with Juan Pablo and make a few notes maybe and see where we're at. And Tom and Cliff will be the first time they're meeting each other, which is awesome. And just great to, to get all, to get family and friends and, 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 you know, the, the family of musicians, uh, that have been in my life for so long, get everyone in the same place again. And, and start working on the process. Um, there is going to be a clinic um, at noon on the 2nd. I believe, oh, not the 2nd, sorry. At noon on the 5th, August 5th, 12 o'clock. And I did write it down because I was chatting to Juan Pablo about it. So I am going to mention the name of the school. Oh, why don't I have it in my brain? I did put it in my, um, I did put it in my, on my website so it is right there uh bam this must have been on a voice message because it's not written in our chat oh well um it's on the website go check it out com, and uh it's um yeah i'm really looking forward to that to get a clinic in a master class and and meet a bunch more people and and do a little hang and then there's the gig that night as well so the gig i was meant to get all the details today but i still don't have them in the next couple of days i'm sure it'll be up on my website so saturday the 5th is the big day of public stuff the master class and the, and the show with the band and then we'll get to it for four days in the studio um so the focus of these next four weeks while i'm home is just Actually, you know what? I don't know exactly what it is. I was thinking about this earlier on and thinking, okay, what do I need to do? Like just running down the inventory in my head and thinking, okay, the first thing I do, um, first thing I need to do is make some kind of list and some kind of plan rather than just batting ideas around my brain and picking one out occasionally and accomplishing that task. Um, I'm, I'm getting a bunch of material now. I, it's like slowly building momentum in terms of the writing. And I kind of have, I have a list of names for songs, at least, even if I don't have if enough songs to, to match those names. And I, But I do have that pool of music and material, even if they're not complete songs yet. There are fragments and sections and stuff that I will glue together to make into compositions. So much like, I guess... Like when you make a movie, you have a script and then you start to storyboard or some people do, I believe that's part of the process and kind of get a, um, a rough um, visual, even if it's not motion picture, but still pictures of what, what they're looking to get done and, and what kind of scenes they're going to shoot. So I want to do something similar like that with the album and really sort of plan it out and say, okay, I've got a certain amount of this kind of material and a certain amount of that kind of material. And I want to make sure there that, that it's dynamic and that it works together and that it tells a story and that I'm not drawing on things that don't make any sense and that don't go together. So it's really important 
to make the storytelling element of the music cohesive. And like I've mentioned a little bit before in 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 previous podcasts over the last couple of months since I launched this project, it's it's probably the most amount of writing I've done. Like the most this mo- most amount of music I'm going to hand the musicians, which is kind of a little bit intimidating because I wish I'd been able to hand it to them sort of a month ago because I know everyone's busy and you know their entire lives don't revolve around my project so when you give the music to people a couple of months ahead of time even if they're super busy it still gives them uh, way more time to you know here and there just those little here and there moments add up over two months over one month and maybe not so much especially if uh, especially if they're busy cats but Either way, that's the kind of thing I'm thinking about right now. That's the kind of, uh, that's where I'm at with the preparation and this whole 4th of July thing and being on the road and coming back home and and getting back into dad duty and home life. Uh, The kiddo was not in daycare yesterday or today, so that kind of took away two days of writing. So I'm looking forward to getting back to that sort of immediately. Like that's, um, I I can picture it like dropping her off and driving home and coming straight down to the studio and firing out the piano and, and starting to really sort of polish compositions and you know there there are a few newer ideas that have come up since I've been on the road so I have voice notes about that and a few written you know notes of manuscript paper and just kind of piecing it together Um, don't forget if you want to be a part of this the pre-sale is happening right now and will be happening until the album comes out in a couple of months but the pre-sale is at yannickwasdala.com I'll link it in the show notes or I'll link it below the video if you're watching on YouTube Um, and that kind of like I've mentioned before the 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 number of people who go out and and get involved with the pre-sale kind of it's not uh the album happening isn't contingent on hitting any sort of financial goal. I'm going down there to make the album no matter what. But the more people that get involved, kind of the more um, sort of epic uh, um, width it might attain and breadth it might attain in terms of what I'm able to do musically and um, how I orchestrate some of these ideas. So there's a chance that it might just be the trio if I don't end up having um, surplus budget to do, you know, vocals or strings and stuff like that. But I, I'm definitely writing some of these things uh, with augmentation in mind. Um, things that will stand up as just a trio, but also could definitely benefit from a little bit of string or, or choir action. So that's all in motion and will continue to be so. And until the until the project is finished, and there'll be tour dates coming soon for the second week of November in the UK. I believe it's just going to be the UK on that trip, and then I have to work for work work on some dates in the new year. I'm also going to be in Hong Kong and China uh, in October, so look out for dates and details for that. It's a sideman gig. It's with a harmonica player from. Hong Kong is also going to be uh, Manuel Valera from Steve Smith's band and um, Mark Whitfield Jr., I believe, on drums. So I'm looking forward to that. I think it's going to be five or six concerts, something like that. Um, so that'll be a quick trip, a quick week to uh, China and Hong Kong. I haven't been out there in a while, obviously, pre-pandemic. So I'm looking forward to getting back to Asia for sure. I know Japan and China are both booking west western acts like the the quarantine thing isn't happening as as far as i know anymore so it's getting a little safer to travel there and just a little more possible so japan and just you know um far east in general japan china south korea would be awesome taiwan um all places i've been before and, and had a blast playing so the more i can work on that the better and i think having the new album out and concentrating on some dates for 2024 in that part of the world would be awesome i get tons of requests for australia and for new zealand that's a really consistent uh consistently requested part of the world to go and play in and that has been a real while since i've been out there when was i in australia last 2016 i think it's been way too long so all eyes kind of on 2024 to get back to those parts of the world as a band leader. And talking about now and this uh, level is not so high on there. Let's see if I can give it some more juice. Uh, so the intonation isn't great on the bass. These are all things, kind of technical things that I'm 
also thinking about uh, what, th- thinking about working on kind of adding to my list of shit that I really have to do before I go. I do not want to be on a record day. Yeah, that one. Did you hear that one? That's not great. And I don't know whether that's traveling or... I don't know. Maybe these are some old strings. I just played the... Li- yeah, you know, I did just play like three nights, six shows on these strings. So maybe the strings are a little old as well. But the bass definitely needs setting up. The intonation needs working on. I need that to be really spot on for the kind of music I'm trying to make in the studio. Um, and I, this is the bass for sure. Um, you've seen the episodes and the videos in the last couple of months where I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going back to the Madison And this this tour just absolutely proved that it was the right really the right choice um just for a really specific element of my playing um like i said not like the f bass sucks at all the f bass was awesome i did the last vital information tour on it uh didn't i do the last bob reynolds tour on it as well shit you know what i don't remember now damn it i don't remember um but i played it a ton and there were just a couple of elements with my own thing where it didn't work out and uh, it made me want to go back to the Matheson to make this record. So the tour proved that, you know, like I said, Steve gives gives me a lot of freedom to play and do my own thing. And it's a trio and there's a lot of material. So I end up being featured quite often. So I had the opportunity to play in a bunch of different settings, a bunch of different ranges. And uh, that really sort of helps solidify the decision still don't know if i'm going to take a four string down with me the henrik linda matheson maybe or if i'm just going to keep it simple travel with one bass and see if there's a junky old four string in the studio or maybe borrow one from someone in argentina i don't know let's see i think i'll have to make that decision once the music is at least sort of 70 80 percent solidified in terms of what i want to attempt to record i think that's another uh Another key to the success of the recording is not going down there with all this music and telling myself that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is to make a good record. And if the music helps the record be good or even great, then fantastic. Then the music gets recorded. The music that I've written gets recorded. If we get down there and some of it isn't working because we won't have a chance to to find out before before we all arrive in Argentina and play it together, really. Uh, if some some of it isn't working, I have to be prepared to let it go and not deem the trip a failure just because I didn't get to record some of the music I had perhaps intended to. And the trust and... Yeah, just the trust I have in the in the musicians and the, the Juan Pablo in the studio to make a great record regardless of what material I take in there is is supreme and that gives me a lot of confidence to to know that i could go in there without a single note of music written and come out with a fantastic album that's basically what we did with one way out and it was one of the you know proudest recording experiences definitely one of the best if not the best recording experiences of my entire uh career and something i'm like proud to say hey this is my latest record you know that hasn't always been the case i've been pretty neurotic about it you know I'm not saying that the records actually suck and that you shouldn't listen to them. But at times I felt like, oh, I didn't, you know, I I held on too tightly to the music that I'd written and didn't leave any room for improvisation or just playing free or just like getting away from the, from the written, the written, you know, the, the, the sheet music. So that's something I've, I've had to work on over the years. That's something I feel like I have improved a lot on. And it really helps my sort of relaxation and my anxiety. It really helps like take that to zero in terms of, you know, being totally loose when I go down there, not afraid of anything and knowing I'm going to come out of it with something <clears throat> and something I'm proud of as well because I know I can let go in the moment and give an honest performance. And I know the other people that I've hired can do that. It's super important in terms of the criteria when hiring someone. Um, Not only have I got to spend a bunch of time with these people, um, you know, I'm renting a place down there, a house that we're all going to stay at together. So kind of similar to La Casa Morada in Spain last year, where we were all staying on site at the studio. Um, 
we're all going to stay together in the same place and we're going to eat together and socialize and hang out and play this show and you know spend these pretty pretty intense four days in the studio so the, the i have a lot of confidence in those musicians to do that and that's even i think even more so the the environment that they create like the positive environment those musicians create is probably the the biggest key to the success of the whole thing it's like hiring musicians for a record like this everyone who's like on the list to be considered can play like the playing side is, is almost never a consideration because there just aren't people in the in my orbit that can't play you know i just I've always tried to be the worst musician in the room and surround myself with people that are going to kick my ass non-stop and both Cliff and Tom can do that, you know, with their eyes closed. They, uh, <clears throat> I think they're far superior musicians to me. And as a unit, I think we're going to work really cohesively together. So I guess just that, yeah, that's kind of where my head is at um, now in general, not just specific to this recording, but the, as, as a process in general. And I think it's if you are considering doing anything even vaguely similar to what I'm doing, just literally going to the studio and recording something. I think it's worth bearing some of those things in mind and knowing, you know, being confident in yourself, of course, and the more consistent you are with your practice and with your playing. And, you know, like I said, this was an amazing opportunity to go on quite a serious tour this close to playing music in the studio even though that music wasn't mine and it was a really quite a different environment from the one i intend to record just the ability to be around world-class musicians playing for amazing audiences and just you know just compounding that feeling of consistency and that 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 stamina and that freedom that was you know that was absolutely priceless um so yeah, I, I'm i glad. I, at, at one point I was like, oh man, I wish it was closer to the time. You know, I wish it was like, I wish I came home and I only had like 12 days or something between ending the Steve Smith tour and going to, uh, to, to Argentina. In hindsight, I'm glad it's four weeks. I'm glad it's a whole month because it really gives me time to put all of the things that have been sort of reignited from this tour into practice in my writing and then give me the best chance to prepare, you know, whilst, while everything's still relatively fresh, give, give myself the best chance to prepare for success right before I leave. And then things like, you know, logistics and stuff like that. Um, sorry, I'm popping a fisherman's friend here in an effort to help my uh, throat not be so dry. Um, just the, the logistics side of things, i got to say, um, I went back to the SKB base safe for this trip for this tour with Steve and uh, I'm using, oh, actually I actually have them right here, look at this. I'm using these um, Velcro straps. They've got a little metal buckle on them and I'm gonna sneeze. Oh, oh, oh there. Fisherman's friend, every time gets me, like 30 seconds after I pop it in, gets me with a sneeze. So yeah, I'm holding these up on the, on the video here. If you're watching on YouTube, if you're not, go to YouTube, smash the like button. And have a look, and they're they're called. They have envisioned written on them. I can't remember if that's the name of the company. Uh, they were like twelve bucks on Amazon, and they came with a with a pack of ten or something like this. So with the SKB base safe, the big. You know what? I'm going to take the base off. Who am I kidding? There's just too much to talk about. I'm hardly going to play it this episode. And there'll be plenty more leading up to the session where I'm just talking about tunes and composition and harmony and melody and all that stuff. So let's talk about carrying the bass on the road. And I'm working on a big video for the main channel about this, about traveling with the instrument. Uh, spoiler alert, of course, I'm an advocate for checking it. So I'm back with the SKB bass safe. Um, the weak point of it is um, the strap that it comes with. And it's this really cheap plastic buckle it's a total piece of shit i've called skb on it so many times i've called them out about it i've had three of these things the buckle is always the first thing to go and it goes within i don't know weeks it goes within a few trips you know it, it just cannot stand being knocked about so either skb should make their shit with a steel buckle something way sturdier um then it would be literally the perfect case uh if you want to take your instrument on the road, uh, have a gig bag, 
Um, the case itself is not much bigger than the gig bag. It's literally a, a hard plastic shell in two pieces that you put the gig bag in and, uh, and, and and it kind of surrounds it. It's got wheels on it. It's got big handles. It's amazing for moving around. It's super light. It's not heavy. And it's super sturdy. With my bass in a gig bag, I think I also had all my music in there as well. Sheet music. That's not that much weight, of course. Um, but it's something. So I had a gig bag, the bass, and the shell, the SKB bass safe. And it came in at 33 pounds. I'm not sure what that is in kilos. I'm guessing it's around 15 kilos sounds about right for 33 pounds off the top of my head. Um, all right. For the rest of the world, it doesn't work in Imperial. I'm actually going to look that up for you right now. Uh, but long story long, that buckle is absolutely useless that it comes with 33 pounds to kilograms. Hey, so close. 14.9 six nine kilograms so yeah basically 15 kilos and you're all in and the amazing thing is i'm going to get to the strap thing in a second and finish the thought but the bigger thought once i convince you that this is actually uh this this kind of fixes it this little thing from amazon the bigger thought is that when you arrive somewhere what you don't have is this almost keyboard case footprint with a base inside it with no gig bag that you can't like move around with. So, you know, this tour, for instance, is a perfect example of flying somewhere where the tour starts and ends. It's kind of a unique situation. The tour doesn't always obviously start and end in the same place, but Steve routed the tour. So we started out on Long Island. So I flew into Manhattan, Long Island. Then we went west and New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Maryland, uh, DC, and a big loop around uh, Ohio, um, back to New York ultimately for the Birdland shows. Uh, so it was it was unique in that sense that I got to fly in and out of the same place. But I flew in, I stay in an apartment in, in, in Manhattan and a, a place that I get to leave my stuff at. So I uncase the base and then I have a gig bag for the whole tour because we're driving every day, no more flying. So yes, a unique situation, but nonetheless a perfect example of where having a gig bag inside a flight case is one of the most perfect solutions for touring. Because then I like to walk to and from the gig. Um, so it's nice and light. I'm the first one packed up and leaving um, every night. I'm like a phantom after the gig. So I'm gone as soon as the downbeat is, as soon as the last note of the, the thing of the, of the show has faded, I'm packed up in three minutes and I'm out of there. Um, unless there are some of you cats hanging out and get to talk for a minute, but normally I'm gone. Uh, I don't like to leave my gear in the van overnight, uh, at least my base, um, cause who knows where that's parked and how safe it really is. And the base is probably the, the least replaceable thing long-term. You just never know. Like I'd hate for it to get stolen. It's one thing getting like being late, like the, the instruments really get lost. A lot of people talk about, oh yeah, what if you check a bass? What I know I'm going off on some tenders here, but I'm coming back around in a minute. A lot of people talk about, oh yeah, if you check the bass, it gets lost. It rarely gets lost. And if you have an Apple Air tag in it, it's never going to get lost, basically, which I do highly recommend that. I throw an Apple Air tag in the in the gig bag inside the SKB bass safe. I can track it anywhere in the world. Anywhere it's it, anywhere it's around an iPhone, which is most places. So it's, it's not really lost or stolen. It's just delayed. So most of the time your luggage, although of course I know I know shit get does get lost, but for the most part, it doesn't make it on a connection or it doesn't make it on the plane in the first place and it gets lost and it comes on a later flight. So Sorry, even I said lost there. It gets delayed and it comes on a later flight. It doesn't get lost. So you kind of know that it's coming back and you can track it. And, you know, baggage handlers generally aren't trying to, you know, take out the air tag and toss it on the train tracks and run away with the instrument. So you get your instrument back. If it gets stolen out of a van, this is a very different situation. Like somebody is there to steal your instrument. They're going to be on the lookout for the air tags. <clears throat> the chances of getting it back are very slim. So I never leave it in the van overnight, always take it to and from the hotel. And I love to walk if it's not raining or if we're staying close to the close enough to the venue and we have the time. So having the gig bag on the road is a huge bonus, a huge plus. 
and has become basically essential for me. I don't like to travel any other way. So when you see these, your SKB, I have one. I've used it before. SKB make this I series case and basically it, it could be it could be a keyboard case. It's just oblong. It has wheels, but the top handle for pulling it is kind of not in the right place. Is again a piece of gear that someone's designed that kind of never been used by them i guess or never been used in any sort of realistic situation <clears throat> and it's big and bulky and that thing is heavy right that's way heavier than the skb base safe there's just so much more material it's just way larger of a footprint um a lot bulkier when i've checked that thing you know when it has been applicable and i've used a case like that i've checked that thing i get way more questions even though people question the skb base safe and say hey is that are those guns in there? I get that all the time when I check in. When you do the big rectangular one, holy shit, it's the first thing they're asking about. It's not like a casual afterthought or question. That's like the first thing they leave with. Okay, so what? how many guns have you got in here? And you can get it with foam. So you can pluck out the foam to the shape of your instrument. I did that or cut out the foam and the instrument or sit in there. No problem. Um, so... Yeah, but but then you then you then you're there and you have no gig bag and you have this huge case that you have to take fucking everywhere. And if you're in a van traveling somewhere, you I guarantee you are not trying to take that in and out of the van to the hotel every night. It's just such a pain in the ass and so heavy. So I am a big fan of having the clamshell, the the SKB base safe with the gig bag inside. So I have real freedom of movement. Um Again, this tour involved a recording session at the last minute, so I ran to the studio uh, with, with the bass in the gig bag, and it was super easy. Um, didn't have to have this this uh, this case with me, this hard case, and so that's that's going to differ for everyone. You know, this was a driving tour that started and finished in the same place. Of course, you're going to fly to Europe, and then you're going to start in. Well, let's see. I started in. Um, where the hell did I start last time? Went to Europe, like. With Bob's band, I think was the last one. We did a pretty long stretch. We started in, I want to say, Amps. We flew to Amsterdam, and then we finished in Glasgow or something, and fl ended ultimately flew out of London. So definitely not anywhere, uh, anywhere close, <laughs> really, to each other. So I couldn't leave the case and then do the whole tour. Plus, there were plenty of fly dates in between. So I was checking it every day. Um, <coughs> but even still, the. Uh, the SKB base safe was was definitely the way to go, and even the micro version of what I just did. You know, I arrived in New York, took it out of the case, left the case in the apartment, and then seventeen days later, put it back in the case to go to the airport, and everything in between was driving. But just being able to arrive by plane on the morning of a gig, let's say it's a fly fly tour. Of course, they're going to be flying tours, they're going to be train tours, they're going to be van tours. There's all kinds of different touring, but let's just say. For, for for the for this example, you, you're flying, your early morning flight normally, if you play the same night, you're arriving to the hotel, you're checking in sometime after lunch maybe, but then you're going to sound check at 4.30, 5 o'clock. And the great thing is you leave the hard case in the hotel room, you go with the gig bag, super light to the venue, play the gig, play the sound check, play the gig, come back to the hotel, throw the thing in the flight case and it's ready to go to do the whole thing again the next morning. No schlepping around a massive flight case. Now, there are tons of different flight cases, of course. Oh, actually, yeah, because I was using, <laughs> on that Bob tour, I just remembered which case I was still using, even though it was kind of finally broken by then. Um, I had the Groove Gear capsule, which I'd used. I kind of dug it. Initially, the first tour I used it on, which was uh, pre-pandemic. So that was the Bob Reynolds tour, early 2000, uh, February, March 2000. Um, so I did put it through kind of two weeks of its paces. And it seemed to hold up structurally at the time. But literally, that was the first time. I, I went to Vancouver to do the Drumio Drum Festival with Vital Information, just one show, and Benny Greb two shows i guess uh so that was just a fly date wasn't really a good test of it but then right after went to europe with bob the pandemic tour the covid19 tour and uh we were doing all of that flying every other day and trains and driving like all the shit and i was like oh, okay this is this it's a cool idea i think the capsule is a cool idea but the wheels are too high 
um, the the strap that detaches that you can pull it along with is is not fixed, so the thing just falls over all the time. It, it just rotates. It's pointless. You need a grab strap that is permanently like that is that is there and is fixed, so you have control of it. Otherwise, it's just literally just spinning around. Massive pain in the ass. And then the wheels, they're like these beautiful skateboard wheels. And they are removable, which I think is a great idea. So they don't get smashed to pieces um, by, you know, when you check luggage and stuff on the plane. Uh, But they're way too high. So the profile of the back of the case as you're dragging it along is just too unstable. And if you utilize what they advertise you should utilize the case for, which is not only having your instrument, but all the other pockets, again, very well thought out in terms of the interior of the case hard shell in the back base and then three big pockets on top of the base and then a soft shell on the top that you can put clothes in it's kind of like the ideal weekend gig like fly gig bag if it didn't have these sort of fatal flaws of the wheels being too high um the the little spring release pin broke twice already on that um on one of the wheels so at the last tour i had to leave the wheels on i literally was in the middle of the tour the the the, the pin broke and it was either take the wheel off and then have no more wheels on it or leave it on and risk it getting smashed and i had to leave it on risk it getting smashed it didn't get smashed luckily but big design flaw right there and then the top strap just it needs to be it needs to be fixed it needs to be a grab strap that's fixed like the top of a rolling duffel bag or something um but then, like, after all of that, and the reason I'm not using it anymore, the reason I actually just have to trash it right now is because it literally, the, the, the zipper and stuff is not of the greatest quality. And it just separated from the from the soft side of the case, which rendered it really useless. Like, the other things you could just about get by uh, with and troubleshoot, but this was like, okay, there's a gaping hole in it now. So, unfortunately, that's not the most ringing endorsement of the product. Um but there it is. That's the real world. Like I really put it through his paces. The last tour I did with Bob was trains, trains, planes, and automobiles. Check it out. And, um, and a lot of them like real touring, not some like YouTube video looking all fancy, walking through an airport with a slick bag. You know, this thing, like I put it through his real touring paces and it, it unfortunately didn't hold up. So again, I'm sure for some people it'll work great. Um, I've almost done my whole fucking video of flying with an instrument in this podcast, but I'm going to do it like kind of slick and I have a lot of footage and obviously I have a lot of cases to show as well. I've got some really old school Anvil cases um, that were originally built for the Federas, you know, the super expensive Federas and for real big pop touring. Like that's the big difference as well. If you don't have to carry this shit and you're like global rocket cargo or domestic rocket cargo, or whatever, just somebody's crating your stuff and then picking it up from your house in a, in a cartridge truck and sending it, you know, to the rehearsal space to, you know, to the rehearsal studio, what they're sending it to the first gig and you have a tech, you never have to deal with that. Yeah. I got some big old cases, no gig bags, no SKB base safe, none of that shit. Don't need it. You show up and you hold your hand out and your tech puts your bass in your hand with fresh strings perfectly in tune. Uh, That's a whole different world. One I'm currently no longer a part of and um, quite happily so, I must say, uh, even though it did come with its perks, you know, having all that, you know, having all that kind of luxury of just being able to show up and play music. That's, that was, that was always nice. Um, but yeah, so I have a ton of cases. And before I ditch the capsule, I'll, I'll, I'll feature that as well and just highlight what I liked about it, what I didn't, and really kind of give, um, try and give good reviews of it all. And and more, most importantly, give real world information for people that are doing touring and traveling and just, or even just one-off gigs of all different types. There, I really don't think there's a one size fits all solution Uh, I don't think it's like my way or the highway at all, uh, but I can provide some pretty compelling cases, (laughs) no pun intended, um, for doing it the way I do it and give, you know, give you an idea of the experience I've had both as a staunch advocate for always carrying the bass on. I was always the carry the bass on guy. Don't get me wrong. Like I've done all of the 
all of the, 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 the sneaky little moves to get that thing on the plane all over the world and on, I don't know, I've lost count of the number of airlines that I've done that with. All of them, basically. Some that don't even exist anymore. Um, just that I'm just old. So, yeah, I, I was that person. I really was. And it's just, it's too stressful. Like, if you're traveling with an instrument that you're... <coughs> that will like destroy your uh, margin. Like if your instrument is $10,000 or $15,000 or whatever it is, and that will just like crush you financially if something happens to it, uh, you should probably think about maybe not traveling with that instrument and, and not being so precious about it. That'll probably be the one contentious thing uh, or the most, yeah, probably the th that'll be the thing that gets the most comments and the most blowback on when I put that in the video and explain my, my point of like hey stop being stop being so married to your instrument you know it's not like this bass sitting right here isn't a, i think these are like ninety eight hundred dollars if you get them like fully handmade i know they're not cheap it's not a twelve hundred dollar bass and i am flying with it and i am checking it but if it doesn't show up i don't care um and if it gets broken it doesn't it, it doesn't change my life and now I know some some people might reach out immediately and say, "Well, you didn't pay for that instrument, so that's not like ninety eight hundred dollars of your own money uh, disappearing down down the down the toilet." Fair point, um, but at the same time, if we can get past the money and concentrate on the music and what it what it means to me and my ability to play music on that side of things, I don't care, and I also don't care to re replace it with a ten thousand dollar instrument. Because I don't actually think you need one, uh, so there's a whole sort of argument and you know discussion to happen around that, I guess. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, like you, you stop being so precious about your instrument. Basically, is the is is the key. And if you do it the right way, if you case it up, and if you you know follow all the basic sort of strategies and just the basic logistics of creating a, a, an instrument up or p packing it up and put it in a flight case <clears throat> you're not it's not going to get the neck is not going to get snapped off the base in an skb base safe with a gig bag it's just not going to happen yeah you might lose a, a a machine head or something might get chipped or yeah sure your base is going to get used you know, it's more likely to get like kicked off a stand on stage or somebody pushes it over in the dressing room or something like those things are way more likely to happen than the airline doing anything to it. Um, and I'm talking as a person who's been flying with an instrument since I was 17 years old, which is uh, 20, what's that, 27 years now. It's not a short amount of time. Um, so have I seen it all? No, uh, I'm not even going to pretend that I've seen it all. I don't think anyone has. I don't think it's possible to, but have I seen a lot? Absolutely. Have I owned just about every level of case, both soft and hard, uh, that you could, that has ever been made? Yes, I have. And I have a lot of them in the, in my storage here still to this day. So I look forward to like sharing all that, like the, the, the deeper details of it and making a nice edit. So it's a little more of a succinct, um, explanation and sort of a compelling story than this sort of rambling rant that I still didn't even <laughs> get to the point about these little Velcro straps that sort of saved me and brought that case back into life. So let's get to that right now. Um, envisioned, like I said before, is what it says on the on the little uh, tag here. I can't remember if that's the company or not, um, but they just a Velcro strap with a little buckle and I put it around the main where, where the two pieces of the SKB base safe are. Uh, join there are really sturdy molded handles and this just goes around i put two of them on actually um put two of them around the handles and i know that the tsa checked the base because they put the little thing in there the little piece of paper they did it both going out and coming back so apparently they're easy enough for the tsa to take off and put back on and they did it pro i mean it's literally a velcro strap it doesn't get a lot easier it's like putting on a seatbelt or something or you know sneakers with it's just so easy um that's why i like it damien erskine uh we we had a discussion about this and he was telling me how i might have mentioned this before i don't know he was telling me how his 
SKB bass have to buckle. It lasted for years, and he's like he tours like he's not a stay at home guy. He he's on the road like Damien tours, and he knows what's up. And um, I, I had this long car. I said, "Yeah, his buckles are a piece of shit." I've had three of them; they've all broken. And not a week later, after I'd seen him in Portland, he texted me. He said. Yep, the buckle just gave up, and I'm like, man, this you know, could be my fault. I'm, I'm maybe a bad, <laughs> a bad omen for those things. But he was telling me about having, I think it was a dog collar, a literal dog collar from his dog that he put that he wrapped around there. So another thing that's really simple to to put together, and uh, that got me thinking, like, oh, I could resurrect my SKB base safes. We, you know, without having to get that strap remade. And on one of them, I'd like cut the strap off just so that it wasn't flapping around. Um, another thing is cable ties are great. You can get them either removable, uh, which is easy for the TSA to remove, or they'll just clip them. Um, you can, and you know, I always throw a couple of extra ones inside. I, I have like left a note in there, like a nice note saying, hey, if, if you know, if you see this, could you please just throw these cable ties back on the, the, the case after you've done it? But I think I did that once or twice or something and it didn't really matter because I forgot it like five times and they absolutely cut them off and they checked and they found the other cable ties and they put them back on. So there was that. But this is a really simple, reusable solution that you don't have to keep buying bags of cable ties, zip ties for. And uh, yeah, like I said, I put two of them on and so far I'm two for two. So let's see what happens in uh, going to Argentina, going to China and Hong Kong and also to Europe. I've got a bunch of trips coming up this year. I plan on using the SKB base safe for all of them. So nice to have the gig bag um, to go to go to and from the gig from the hotel. Um, so that's the plan. Um, what else? There, the thing is, there are just I've been writing stuff down, making lists of stuff I want to talk about, and sort of getting a storyline together for the main video about about the cases because there are just so many variables, and I really, you know, I don't want it to be like, well, this is I put everything in there I possibly can, and just just don't bother me now. I, I want there to be a discussion for sure, and I know despite all the inf all the uh, experience I've had, I know there are going to be some people that are like, well. What about this situation that I've perhaps never been in before? And maybe I can offer some uh, some advice on that, but uh, for sure I'm going to be learning something and I will have new situations to ponder that I perhaps haven't been in yet and may well be in in the future and need to plan accordingly for. So it's going to be a two-way street. It's not just going to be a diatribe of... Uh, you know, flight case bullshit from me. Uh, I know I'm going to learn something in the comments from that and get people's different perspectives on it that I do not currently have access to with my experience. And it, it's going to be interesting. Like I'm literally uh, sitting here on the floor, like out of shot is my, one of my oldest cases. It's a reunion blues double case. And I, <laughs> I used to carry a fretless and a fretted around in that to Berkeley, like literally every day, leaving the house and going out with that thing on my back. Cause, hey, maybe I'm going to need to play a little fretless or maybe I'll play Fred. It would bullshit i've rarely played the fretless ever um so but it's i still have it it's an amazing bag really sturdy i know tim lafave uses the reunion blues one of their newer ones and he checks that thing and it's not technically a hard case so that should give you a little indication about like not being so fucking precious with your super fancy instruments um like just Take a tablet, relax a little bit, do it the right way, you know, understand that it's not the, the whole fucking United Breaks Guitars phenomenon. Remember this from maybe it's like 10 years ago or something and the, these fucking idiots, I mean, just idiots. Like who is checking a precious instrument in basically the piece of shit hard case that's in, in, in big inverted commas that the instrument comes in from the store? Not a flight case. Massive difference between a hard case and a flight case. And what you're doing, I think, when you put it in a hard case that isn't a flight case, is you're inviting the thing to be thrown. There's an argument, I think, that, and maybe this is why, I'll tell the little story about why I started doing this, and, and, and maybe this is also why it works for Tim Lefebvre as well with that Reunion Blues that isn't, it's not a hard case or a flight case. It really is a gig bag, but a, quite a sturdy one. So I was in... Uh, Narita in Tokyo in, in, in the airport finishing up a Chuck Loeb tour. Um, amazing guitar player. 
um, kind of mentor of mine and somebody I was fortunate enough to work with for a little while before he, he sadly passed away. Um, and we were in the airport and we're both going there and I've got my gig bag, you know, and I'm the Mr. Get on the, get on the plane with the instrument guy. Uh, to the point where in Japan, I, maybe even on that trip, they forced me to buy a seat for it. It was like one of those ones, like the worst experience on every level from the check-in to the security to the gate, like the three main areas that you have to deal with taking anything, whatever it is you're carrying on to the plane. And just the worst thing. And finally at the gate, they were like, no, you have to buy a seat. We are not. And you get on the plane and this plane's half empty and the overheads are all, are all empty. And it was just their policy. And it was a and I think, because um, I was taking an, uh, an internal flight from, <clears throat> I want to say Haneda to Obihiro or something like that. Or I don't know. It doesn't matter. I was taking a domestic flight in Japan. They were like, no, you have to buy a, a, a seat for this. So Anyway, that was me at the, at, the, at the lowest point of Mr. Bass on the plane, Mr. Bass carry-on guy. Anyway, at the end of that tour, I'm, I'm there with Chuck. We got, went to the airport together, and we're both – I'm flying back to L.A. He's flying back to New York, we're both on different flights. But we're checking in with United at the same desk because um, our flights were around the same time. And there he is with his electric guitar and kind of a – not quite an acoustic, but like a hollow body, something. He had two instruments with him, and they were in a double bag, not dissimilar from my Reunion Blues, kind of soft case. And it was a soft bag. It was a double gig bag, and not a particularly sturdy one. It wasn't like, oh, I think that stands a chance. It was like, okay, that was that's what I'd take to the gig at home. And that's not what I would fly from Japan to, to the east coast of the United States with, with my prized instruments. Um, because that was my mentality at the time. I was like way attached to the I was playing the Federa, of course, and it doesn't get much more expensive than that in, in terms of taking an instrument on the road. And, and in that moment, I see him just handing the gig bag over and they put it in a little um, plastic tray and, and off it goes. Like not with the bags down the conveyor belt, but, you know, like the, the odd size luggage. They took it there. The same place I put my flight case now. And I looked at him, I was like, what, what, what just, and the, I saw it going away and he's just like totally loose and he's got his little carry on tiny little bag that he's walking, going to walk through the airport with as light as a feather, just breezing. And there's me with the bass and backpack, just, uh, just a whole bunch of crap that, yeah, it just really makes me feel like, just, blah, think, even thinking about walking through an airport with an instrument now. Anyway, he says, yeah, I've been doing this for years. And had never had a problem with it. Like he had literally never had an instrument get damaged checking it in a soft case. So all of that just to illustrate that that was a the thing that you know, I wasn't going to go that extreme, especially at the time. The crossover I understand is me saying stop being so precious with your fucking fancy instruments. I understand that's not something that happens overnight. Uh, as I, I speak from experience, it took me a while to be like, okay, I'm going to take this amazing instrument that cost you know 15 grand or something if I need to replace it. Uh, I'm going to put it in this flight case and I'm going to be still a little more precious about it than I should. So it took a couple of years to figure that out um, and to you know really be a little more relaxed about it. And eventually. Here I am, you know, it's been uh, 15 years now or something that I didn't check the bass or 10, 12. It's been a lot of years that I didn't check the bass uh, in situations like that. I didn't carry the bass on, sorry. Um, and I've always checked. So, yeah, it, it is possible. There are cats out there doing it now, even without flight cases, without even hard cases. And I think I got to that by saying, by highlighting that whole United Breaks Guitars thing. And there is, you know, a sense of... Well, they were idiots, first of all, for checking those instruments in those. I saw, like, in their video, I saw the kind of cases. It's that shitty piece of shit Fender-style case that is is just a hard case. That I, I, Honestly, I don't know why they make them. It's like, if you're going on a plane, put it in a flight case. Are you going to a gig? Take it in a gig bag. Like, unless you really have to, like, stack them up. Or I, I, I never understood those cases. Anyway, I think that baggage handlers possibly don't, see any difference between those hard cases and a flight case and they, 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 are, they are technically hard and solid so they'll just throw them and they'll put things on top of them thinking they're capable of holding way more weight than they are. A flight case will hold 
hundreds upon hundreds of pounds. You could stack a ton of shit even on that SKB base safe, which is not the most robust thing out there, and it will be fine. Those shitty fender cases, even the tw- and like tweed cases and stuff like that, they'll cave. Though you put 50 pounds on them and you're like, oh, I don't know about that. And then you move them around a little bit, forget about it, it's over. So they were idiots for doing that. And I think there's something to be said for <clears throat> perhaps a, a baggage handler seeing something that is obviously a soft case and be like, oh, you know, I might not be a guitar tech and know exactly how to handle this thing, but I know I perhaps shouldn't bury it under 200 other bags and I perhaps I shouldn't throw it, you know, onto, you know, of course there's always going to be one or dozens. I don't know, but there's always going to be some baggage handlers who just throw it no matter what it is. I have seen that. I know it happens. So you roll the dice with that. You know, I'm not suggesting anyone check their stuff in a flight case, in a soft case, sorry, despite the fact that I know people do it and have done it with, with great success um i think there's a happy medium there i also understand and i will have to find a way to articulate this the best way i also understand that there are budget constraints and that not everyone can have the exact same things that i'm going to mention uh, although i'm going to try and provide the most economical but robust setup i possibly can and i think the skb base safe at 185 bucks or something look if you've got a gig that you're flying on you probably should, even if the gig doesn't pay amazing, you should probably invest 185 bucks in the thing that's going to keep your instrument uh, safe and um, the thing that's going to make it easiest for you to be on the road. Um, I know that was something I did very early on when I started flying and actually having some income from music was like, oh, I need these few essential things. And back then they were super expensive. The SKB Base Safe didn't even exist. And we're talking about bulky, bullshit flight cases that were a pain in the ass to deal with. And um, come, buddy. Want to get up? Coley's back. I think the fireworks are still going out there. Jesus. Um, Yeah, back then there definitely weren't as many options as there are now. But, you know, Adam Neely made this video a few months ago and he he clipped an old vlog episode from 2017 of me on a plane and I'm sitting there. I'm sitting there in first class. I'm watching everyone come on the plane and I see the guy get on with the big bulky gig bag. And like, there's a, I'm not saying, hey, I'm I'm flying first class to be all fancy and and, and shove my ego out there. It's one of the perks. And it's also something I'll talk about in the flying with the instrument thing. It's one of the perks of, um, you know, if if you're in that situation of being able to get on the plane first to where if you have status you're not only am am i afforded free upgrades which is (laughs) i don't buy first class tickets let's throw that out there right away but i am afforded many many free upgrades as a result of my status for being loyal to one airline and doing all my miles with them so that used to be fantastic when i was carrying the base on because i would always have the option to get on the plane first even if i wasn't upgraded to first class my status would still allow me to board early when all of the overheads were empty um, and United Airlines specifically, some years ago, uh, a friend of mine was dating a, a United Airlines flight attendant, and she showed us a letter, which was a directive from the then CEO. I don't think he's there anymore, but he was like, hey, um, if you see these shaped cases like musical instruments, these are how musicians make their living, and it's really important to them that they get there in one piece with them at the same time. Please uh, make as many Accommod- as much accommodation as you possibly can for them in coat closets, allowing them to get on the plane first so they might put it in an overhead uh, bin that's empty before the plane fills up. So I had a lot of respect for United Airlines for that. You know, that was m- many years ago, actually. And I know I'm sure people listening to me, ah, United sucks. I've had a really bad experience with them. Well, let me tell you, if you don't have status with an airline, you're going to have way more poor experiences with them. Um, than if you have status so i'm just it, it's worth bearing that in mind you might have had really bad delta or american or, or united or whoever it is lufthansa singapore cathay pacific you know who knows J- jal wherever you are in the world british airways um if you don't have status with them like the status basically means they treat you like a human being <laughs> the status doesn't open some 
uh, uh, Shangri-La of 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 uh, of flying. It, it just you basically start to get. It's like flying first class. You basically start to get treated like a human being, and uh, not like a second class citizen. That's that's basically what it is. And with that come some perks. So again. I know there are going to be so many different levels and different styles of traveling and band leader, sideman, freelance, this, that, and the other thing, country, pop, rock, jazz, uh, different kinds of instruments, weights of instruments, scale lengths of instruments. You know, there, there are so many variables to it. Um, but at the end of the day, if you really push for doing all your miles with the same airline and stay in the same alliance, you have many, many more capabilities than if you just go with the cheapest flight or always buy basic economy and, and stuff like that. In the long run, if, if this is what you want to do for a living and if you travel regularly with an instrument, status with an airline is going to be huge. Um, and I'm going to break down a bunch of that stuff in the video. Man, this the video could be four hours long, but I'm going to try and get it into like a 12-minute edit and really highlight all the things that I've been able to do uh, over the years as a result of kind of lining up all of those those elements of of the traveling thing as a musician and not not only about like getting on the plane first if you do think you want to carry the instrument on and, and having that kind of direction to go but if you're like me and you check the instrument it starts to get kind of complicated when you're traveling and it's like oh so what am i going to check i've got i want to check some clothes right if you long tour you got I, I have a big rolling duffel um that has all my clothes in it i'm like oh shit well that's one um now i travel with the pedal board so that's two that's two pieces so that's shit i now i, I want to check the bass as well so it's always three pieces that i'm checking always so look at the last airline you flew if you don't have status with an airline if you just go whatever you go delta this way you go american the other you go british airways another day like whatever if, you, if you're that kind of flyer just check out how, how much that even how much that okay i was gonna say how much the second bag costs and the third bag check out how much the first bag costs without status most airlines if you're buying an economy ticket or even basic economy i know a lot of people are trying to do that and a lot of people are trying to fly musicians basic economy you have to put your foot down with that bullshit not only do they not make you as much, that they provide you with as much status elevation, but they come with basically nothing. Um, so yeah, first bag, somewhere in the $50 range. Second bag, if you're lucky, it's just another 50. Uh, but most airlines, it's a hundo. It's a, it's a bill. And then the third bag on some airlines, you're looking at 250 300 $400 sometimes for the third bag on an airline. So what have you just done? Doubled the cost of your flight, like doubled the cost of a transatlantic flight from New York to London or New York to Paris, just on the bags that you need to check as a touring musician. So one of the perks I have <clears throat> as a, I mean like uh, well, the very top tier is like invite only, like it's an Amex black card kind of thing, which is invite only, which is global services. But the four main uh, categories that you can be at in, in terms of your status level. I'm always in the top one, which is 1K with United um, because I do that many miles and spend that amount of money on traveling for work every year. Um, that affords me three bags at 70 pounds, like 32 kilos, three bags, somewhere around there, 70 or 75 pounds, 32, 34 kilos, something like that. Um, but three bags on every flight, on every United flight. And that affords me also on, on other airlines and uh, airlines within the Star Alliance network, which are like Lufthansa, Singapore, Thai, SAS. Uh, God, there are so many. TAP, Portugal, South African Airways, uh, ANA. It's, it's an amazing, I think Star Alliance is the biggest network and the most, like Air New Zealand is in there. There's just so many coming to me. Ethiopian Airlines, like you're really sort of catered for on all fronts is it latam or there's there's one um avianca or something there's one south american one as well even though united flies to south america a bunch copper airlines used to be in there um i used to fly through panama a lot with them so it's just useful to have that network of airlines if and again this really speaks to probably a very small segment of the musical community who's really traveling that much as a professional musician but all of these things i wish i'd known this shit when i was 17 you know all those flights i took to and from berkeley you know even like london to boston you know those flights alone 
you know, six, eight of them a year or something back and forth for the first couple of years would have been great for status. I wish I'd been building that and doing it all with the same airline right from the get go. So if you're of that age and you're just getting into it and you have plans to really travel, it's worth, you know, worth thinking about the airline credit card or the big bonus mile credit card, you know, that, that gets you points. <clears throat> all of those things help. Um, anyway, I've just spent way too long talking about travel. All I wanted to really do was highlight the fact that SKB Base Safe is back thanks to these little Velcro straps that you can get on Amazon. If I find my Amazon receipt in the email, maybe I'll put the link in the in the description, even though they're not sponsoring this video. Uh, and that's it. Don't forget the sales going on right now. Uh, red, white, and base is the coupon code to get 25% off all the books. HX Stomp presets, the music, the private lessons are half price right now. No need to use the coupon. They are already discounted. Um, and like I said, you can buy as many as you like and use them over time. We'll do it via video. Uh, but to get them half price you have to get them now while the sale is going on um and yeah no problem scheduling them out for the future and using them as and when you need um i know that's been popular in the past people want to take like two or three lessons but they want a few months to work on the stuff from the first lesson so i like to be flexible with that and now i do have some time for the first time in a long time especially since closing the subscription side of the base studio it's really sort of opened up some time to do some private teaching, which I'm kind of psyched about. So that's it. What I thought was going to be a quick episode because I'm jet lagged and tired out of my mind ended up being one of the longer ones. So um, if you stuck around this long, really appreciate that. And uh, yeah, catch you all on the next one. Later. Mm -hmm.